Soy un brasileño, pero vivo en, yo moro en los Estados Unidos a 25 años, so, soy un gringo. No. Y mi español es all portuñol. And this is how I learn Spanish. Portuñol maroto mina, portuñol travieso. And in Brazil, we, every, every word we end with cueca or ito. So Coca-Cola is cueca cuela. Right, enough of nonsense. Um, right, I got 30 minutes to go over the wonderful world of how to manage Kubernetes resources, if I can get, all right. Right, again, my name is Rafa Brito. I'm a staff engineer for Stormforge. I have a one little slide about Stormforge. Um, going to very quick about me, Brito Rafa. I'm muy viejito. Just started my career in the 90s with Novel Nature at HPOX. Levanta manos. Who did Novel Nature? One person, two per uh, Yeah. In Portuguese, we say, tamo junto. Um, from Rio, Carioca, um, and live in New York for 12 years, and Austin 12 years. I'm loco for cloud optimization and reduce waste for many reasons. Mucha plata, energy, save the world, etc. cetera. Um, my first Kubernetes in production was 2016. Uh, I was the platform engineer for Citigroup for many years. Um, I know all the pain of scaling uh, Kubernetes and training, et cetera, managing users. Uh, before Kubernetes, my background has had been uh, great computing and high frequency trading. And I worked for VMware for three years. And, um, and when I moved to VMware, what I really wanted is tackle problems that I had at Citigroup. And one of the problems was multi-cloud migration Etc. And I invade, invented the, the Kubernetes migrator. I think you've mentioned tons of mission control um, and tons of service mesh. That's what I did over there. Right now in Stormforge, what we do is optimize clusters at scale using machine learning. There is a talk with John Platt, uh, the CTO, in a couple hours. We're going to talk about this as well. But how we can manage at scale Kubernetes. It's not easy. You need some something like machine learning to help. Um, I'm involved in the community. I am, uh, I co-run with Chad, the Austin CNCF meetup, um, and KCD Texas, it's mid, I shouldn't say about this right now, it's unofficial, but it's something happened next year in Texas that starts with the letter KCD. Um, and, um, and I speak at KCD, multiple KCDs, KD, KCD Sao Paulo. Uh, le, levanta a mano, who is Brazilian? Who is Brazilian? Two? Right, tamo junto. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was in Porto last week. All right, one thing, I tend to say bad words, so bear with me, and I usually translate this, why should I give a shit about resource management? Um, Three reasons. Uh, one, avoid performances, performance problems, right? You never know when each, each workload running on Kubernetes is neat. Second, reduce cloud costs. When you ask, everybody requests more than actually need. That's part of life. Um, I, I've done no judgmental, but not being judgmental, but that's, that's part of life. Um, and when you have multi-tenant in a large cluster, when we have everyone asking more and more and more, you got a problem. Even if you're on-prem, let's say you don't use cloud, the number one and number three are very important. Right, let's go, let's dive into the basics. Right, I, after all, I'm an engineer. What are requests and limits? Those are very fundamental primitives. Como, como hablo en español requests and limits? Limits is a limite, eh? requests and resources. I didn't, uh. So requests are the minimum that you give to the workload, right? Easy, request, minute, minimum, limits, maximum. 
Um, when you have, in this example, giving, for let's talk about CPU, giving 250 millicores, a limit of 500. So that workload can burst, okay? Very simple, very simple. This is TKA stuff, by the way. Now, let's go a little bit more complex. This is slide a little bit busy. You gotta bear with me on this one. What actually requests are, if I tell you there's not such a concept of millicores in Linux kernel, gonna blow your mind? It's just an abstraction of time, of CPU shares. So in this little busy, table, I have this node of 2,000 cores, like two cores, and then I have a bunch of pods running, and each one, the Nginx requests 125, the Nginx another one, 20, and so on. If you add those up, you're only allocating half of the node. But what Kubelet does behind the scenes, the magic, is converting those in CFS shares. Those are indicating to the Linux kernel how, how much of a share of the CPU each workload will have. So if I still have only 1,000 millicores given, basically those are proportion of the shares. In reality, I'm giving 250 millicores. I know it's a little complicated, but if you have to just think as shares, not actual CPU. And here's the beauty of requests. And by the way, I am the crazy guy on the train that yells, you have to set Kubernetes requests. So I'll so I local in the, in, the, in the bus telling, requests are very important because I've been there, I suffer this in a first hand. So basically, when you give the request, you're telling the Linux kernel, it's yours, nobody else will take. So if you give more requests, you're pretty much sitting on, on CPU not used, if you're not using it. So what's the role of Kubelet? I already said, it, it kind of converts this abstraction into CFS shares, runs CF advisor for checking the resource of the node, it keeps tracks how much of the resource of the node is allocated. And we're gonna talk now about key OSs. That's another CKA concept that's very important to have. Because they're gonna talk a little bit later about when the node is under pressure. And that's what key OS is very important. So basically Kubernetes detects, assigns a key OS for the workload. If you don't set any requests and limits, again, no, not being judgmental, I've been there, it's best effort. Like, we try to get it, um, what you got? Um, burstable, when you have requests lower than the limits. Now, as you know, a pod is compound of one or more containers. So for a guaranteed, when requests and limits are the same, you have to set for every single container of the pod. Then Kubernetes will say, will detect and tell that's guaranteed. Okay, why is this important? All right, let's go to the first demo. Oh, by the way, I used to do this at workshop for 90 minutes. Um, I was a coward, so I, I set up, instead of live demo, I put videos, because it happens to me. Um, that I couldn't run my demos live. So basically, um, I have one cluster with one worker node, and this worker node has two CPUs and two gigs of memory. And by the way, there is a link, if you can do this yourself, how to set up using Mini, uh, Minikube, et cetera. So what I'm doing in this video, showing the node, um, and I will set up <clears throat> three workloads. So right now, um, just showing the capacity and allocatable of the node. Note the difference between the two, very important. Capacity is almost the physical, allocatable is what 
Kubelet going to give to workloads? By design, look at the difference between the memory. I set, when I create this cluster, I put hard, evict hard less than 200. So that's why there's a difference. By default, the difference is almost minimal. But I want to give a lot of room for um, the kubelet. OK, all right, play again. All right, very well. kubectl top nodes, I'm a big fan of top nodes. I have one gig of memory being used at this point on this node. Um, now I'm going to run three workloads. Very important. What the difference about those workloads? This workload is just to consume CPU. And I have three different one, no requests, no limits, C1. C2, requests, I'm going to show on the screen how much I'm, I'm asking. I'm going to pause right here. So the C2 is requesting 500 millicores. And the third one, it's requesting 500 millicores, but with a limit of one CPU. And I have, again, a node with two CPUs. OK, very well. Oh, and uh, now, not only onboarding those, this app, I'm injecting utilization. So this app is from Google, basically just you, it's a resource uh, consumer. You tell how much memory, how much CPU you want. Basically, what I'm doing here, telling each one, consume 550 millicores. And, um, and I happen to have Grafana running here, and I will show you those are in CPU. Um, how much each one is using. So green, no requests, no limits. Yellow, requests and limits. And blue, requests with no limits. OK? Very good. Now the cool part, and I'm going to ask a question. If you answer, I'll give you a, a little gift, a regalo, a regalito. Um, I'm killing on my Portugal. Um, very good. They're running, happy. Each one, 450 millicores. No problem, no contention. Then I go to the one with requests and no limits. Use two cores, 2,000 cores. Remember. My node has two cores. What do you think will happen? Guess. Which process? OK. So you think that container will not use more? It will use more that requested. OK, that's, gonna, that's what will happen. But I have two cores, and I'm asking that guy to use two cores. And there's something that I haven't mentioned yet. CPU is a compressed resource. What does it mean, compressed resource? It expands and not. You don't finish. It doesn't end. So if I put in two, if I have two cores and asking someone to run two cores, let's see what's going to happen. OK. Look what's happening. Look the blue, look at the yellow, and look at the green. The blue is the one that I tell, use more CPUs. Use the entire node. CPU. Come on. Uh, did it go all the way? OK. Let me, let me pause here. Look at what happened with the green, with no requests. No shares for you, dude. You didn't request any. I'm taking from you. I'm giving the one to the blue. 
because that guy had requests of 500 millicores and is using as much. Look at the yellow. Yellow did not starve. Why? Because it had requests. It's guaranteed. Who suffered was the green one. Now it's easy to reproduce this and show in this. Now imagine this in a production system. Happen this in a millisecond. And you, someone call you and said, my application is running very slow. The first thing you have to say, at least in Kubernetes, is look at the requests. Right. Very quick on the second demo. This one is for the limits. Um, I, I injected some actual utilization. Now my application is running 450 millicores each one, but now I'm going to inject on the one that has a limit. Same thing, use two, two cores, the entire node. What we're going to see? This one has limits, so the kernel will throttle that utilization. So that's the whole point of limits, CPU limits. There is a religious war about CPU limits and not CPU limits. I have a slide on it. Right, let's just move on. So the, the moral of the story here, set the requests. Otherwise, you're going to starve of resources. So what the best practice is, that's the religious war. If you have your CPU request right on the money, exactly what each application needs, you're giving the exactly shares of CPU. You don't even need limits because the CFS is going to take care of itself. Um, and some, there are some arguments for CPU limits that came from a multi-tenant, highly regulated company. It had a lot of applications fighting for each other. So that I, I see the point for using CPU limits, but they're more important. When your requests are shitty, that's when you have the CPU limits. Okay. Now let's jump how the scheduler works. That's a little bit of internal how, how the Kubernetes scheduler works. So the Kubernetes scheduler does not give a shit for limits. That's another myth. It only uses the request. Limits are good for nothing for requests. So basically, the kubelet looks how much I gave on this node. The schedule has a list of the nodes, kind of have a score, and assign to pod a node. Um, now I have another question. I, have the, I still have the regalito. Um, if the scheduler uses the requests to find out where you're going to put this pod, what about the ones that do not have requests set? What does it do? He's what? He has the pod? Kill it. No, no. You have a pod. You just schedule a pod. You tell, run this pod for me. Then this, the scheduler is going to find out, oh, I have a pod without a node. Right? So what pretty much what the scheduler does, just set the node name on spec. And then the node name pick that pod and start to run it. But the scheduler has to look at all the nodes in the cluster. Have a thousand nodes. It's going to score all the thousand nodes. Actually, kind of have a, a more speedy way to do this, but it will look for every node. What is the best place for this pod? And it does not have a request. Good try, but no. I'm going to break the news for you. It's hard-coded on the scheduler that we will assume that pod needs 200 millicores and 200 megs of memory. It will assume and will find any node that has that amount of resource free. That means that if you set 
if you have a pod without requests and limits, without requests, and you use three gigs of memory, guess what's going to happen? You're going to put it in a shitty node. So you have to be careful. Again, I am the local at the autobus yelling, gritando, como es importante setar resources. Now, very quick about resource management. Um, now let's talk about memory. Memory differently from CPU is not, a, is uncompressed resource. So let's say you have a node, you set your requests, let's say you don't set the limits, and then one of those applications just run out of control of memory. There are two scenarios. I'm going to show them uh, basically. First one is no doubt of memory. No doubt of memory actually is a system out of memory. The Linux kernel itself is going to figure out, you know, fuck you, I don't have memory. I'm going to, vic I'm going to kill you. So now how you, the, the kernel will decide this? it goes back to the QoS. But the Linux kernel does not know what QoS is. It's not such a concept in Linux kernel. But it does what Kubelet does, converts the QoS and set what we call um score ADJ into the, into the process slash proc. So it's not deterministic. It might be kicking out or killing, not kicking out, but killing is different than kicking out and killing is different. I'm going to kill that most likely first the best effort, then the burstable, and the guarantee is going to be the last one. So if you're running production and you really have a super duper important um, workload, you might consider yourself to run with a QoS guaranteed. So this system out of memory, this is the Linux kernel. There's a second scenario where this time is the Kubelet realizing the pressure. And that's when the memory utilization falls between the, those two allocatable, capacity not allocatable. That's the Kubelet, it will evict the pod, it's different from the previous scenario that was terminating. When the kubelet evicts a pod, it removes um, this dot spec dot node, node, node name from, it calls the API, there's an eviction API, but basically that pod goes back to the scheduler and is for grabs for any other node. So basically it expels the pod, differently from the system um that kills the pod, and the pod will restart on the same node with less memory consumption, of course, but on the um, the pod, the process, it's a, it's a Linux process, it's not, doesn't care if it's a pod or not, it will restart on the same node. So there's two different scenarios. And one thing I Again, the crazy guy on the train is, I see this on the internet all the time, people, oh, my pod eviction because of the pressure of the node. And this, I'm not picking up on this guy, but he wrote the whole Medium post saying that if, when you have a, a, a pod running hot in the CPU, it will get evicted. No, it will not get evicted. It will get evicted because of the memory. CPU, what will happen is on the very first lab, you're going to have a process running without CPU shares. So there's no eviction for CPU utilization, OK? Right, let's go demo to um, very similar. I do have the same node, and I will start three, three workloads. Um, one with. Same deal, right? No requests, no limits. The second one, we requests, 
and no limits. And third one, requests and limits. Um, let me show here. Um, I'm gonna, this command line is going to show the QoS and the resources of each. The QoS, again, Kubernetes does this for you. You don't set it. You set it the requests and limits, and Kubernetes put this. So if you see on the screen, you have those. One is best effort, the second is burstable, and the third is guaranteed. So the ones for burstable and guaranteed, they request 250 megs of memory. And I have a two gig, two gig node, and I think was by I think was using one gig. So this is a very similar um, application. I'm just injecting, hey, use 150 megs each app. So let's see how Grafana is. Um, I put on a memory no, um, namespace. Very well. I have the same deal, right? But now it's memory. Each workload taking 150 megs. OK, there's nothing excited about it. Let's start to get a little bit more excited. Um, first, I will simulate what I call application out of memory. For the one that has a limit of 250, I'm telling it, hey, use 500 megs. Look at this. Look at what happened right off the bat. The application all of a sudden used more memory what the limit is. Look at the status of this pod. Um killed. Um, look, if you do a describe pod, um, describe pod, blah, 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 look at what you got. The state is terminated. The reason, um, killed. This is when the application itself is um. Not the system, not the node, is the application. Okay, that scenario. Now, what happened is the application oomed and restarted to use the same initial settings of memory, right? So let me now go to the second scenario, which is the system oom, when the Linux kernel decides, decides that's not enough. We have to kill someone. So in this scenario, the application restarted. Now I have the three workloads, three pods running, 150 megs any, okay, too fast. Um, yeah, I'm showing here, again, the capacity and allocatable. Look at the difference between the two. So I can give up to 1.8 gigs on an allocatable, and I ran uh, top nodes. So right now, on that node, is 1.4 gigs being used. So the, when you do describe node, describe node will only show allocatable, allocated, not going to give the reutilization, right? You need something like kubectl top um, to, to give that. Um, what I'm going to do now is going to the two pods that there's no limit and increase from 150 to 400 megs each. So they will increase, and they don't have limits. Remember this. I'm injecting, hey, use more memory. Use more memory. And what happening is the consumption went so fast that kubectl didn't evict, didn't do anything, but the Linux kernel did. Look, the, the last day terminated, and the reason error. So the, the process was killed by the Linux kernel. And finally, the last, um, I'm going to have to hurry a little bit. Um, finally, the last scenario is when the eviction. So what I had to do in this um, um, scenario, I need to pick one process and slowly 
increasing the memory utilization, almost like a memory leak. So I'm picking the one that has no requests, low limits, and slowly consuming 50 megs of each second. And now if I do a get pod, look at what you got. The status evicted. So there is different scenarios. So got to be super um, conscious about it. Again, requests are very important. Limits are not important, only if the requests are wrong. How to do this in multi-tenant large clusters, you have tools, primitives coming from Kubernetes. So limit ranges is one of them. Basically, you set by namespace what going to be the minimum, the maximums of requests. You can set up default requests for if someone does not set, it will go and do it for you. Um, you can set up ratio. Um, and one thing is when you do limit ranges, um, it will not change automatically for you. So if you change the limit ranges for default requests and limits, I have a whole blog post how I fuck it up at Citigroup, my first versions, not setting the requests and limits. I had to change multiple times, killing people's jobs, I mean pods, people calling me, what you doing? Like, I'm, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just bringing down the requests and limits. Resource quota, that's how you define limits for namespaces. Very important as well, but you still need something more than this because you can end up adding more namespaces. And then you end up having more requests, I mean, more resources across namespaces than actually your, your cluster has. So in practice, what we do see is Stormforge. First, people have their clusters. They don't bother to set anything. And then you start to have performance problems. Then I'll pick one request and one value for limits. You can end up having the same situation. You have some people using more, using less, um, too expensive. Then you start to go to every application manually looking and then all of a sudden had a team of five to 10 engineers. I had applications knocking my door, my applications running slow, and then I had to dedicate uh, 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 an engineer. It does not scale. So basically you have to get some like artificial intelligence machine learning to do it for you. So this is the Kubernetes elephant in the room. Who gonna set up the requests? It's like one pointing to each other. And here's when I might plug. Um, that's what we do for a living. That's the QR code. We got, um, we got free trials. Um, you basically, you're going to be open, open bar of requests and limits for any kind of workloads, batches, etc. And I really appreciate if you click this because my CTO is going to come in two sessions and we had a, a, a competition who's going to get more clicks. All right. Hi, John. All right, I'm out of the time. If you have any questions, please come. Uh, I still have the two regalitos. Um, if you really want to click and have a meaningful conversation, I have two mugs to give. All right, thank you so much.